Hi, everyone, and welcome to a new episode for 2022 of Plant Services Tool Belts Podcast. Today, we've got a really special episode for you. It's our, a trends episode. Looking forward into the year 2022 to see what new technology and maintenance trends are going to be uh, facing industry in 2022. And today for this podcast, we've got Aaron Merkin, who is the CTO of Fluke Reliability. Um, Aaron, thanks for being with us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself um, and some of the projects that you're working on at Fluke um, that relate specifically to the, the maintenance sector? Oh, certainly. Um, so I'm the CTO for Fluke Reliability. I've been with the business about 11 months. I'm responsible for all of our hardware and software engineering uh, and product development. About uh, two decades of experience developing uh, enterprise software and solutions uh, for uh, industrial, well, for across a variety of industries in the last decade or so, uh, specifically serving asset intensive industries, uh, developing MRO solutions. Uh, and here at Fluke, we're focused um, kind of in two major areas. We have uh, a large uh, CMMS offering uh, called eMate, so to help out with like, daily maintenance activities and um, particular maintenance activities uh, on the other portion of the portfolio, uh, we're very much focused on condition monitoring, and that's a combination of remote, remote condition monitoring uh, services offerings, as well as uh, route-based and continuous um, vibration monitoring solutions. Well, and the way that offering covers so many bases when it comes to uh, a full-blown reliability system that can uh, pull the data in, help analyze it, uh, spit out reports, uh, and send alerts. I mean, that's, that's part of the reason I appreciate you being on today's podcast, because you and the team sort of cover so many areas of what's coming that you have to be ready in all areas for uh, the innovations. Indeed, I think we you know we were looking um, historically. This has been an industry, particularly in the use of vibration for condition monitoring, that's been heavily targeted at experts, mm-hmm. uh, requiring many many years of training and hands-on practical experience. Um, and we're looking forward to being able to apply advanced technologies such as AI and ML uh, to really make that same type of vibration-based condition monitoring available to non-experts. Oh, cool. Well, let, let's hang on to AI and ML. We'll get to that in a near in the end of the podcast. I wanted to start with a topic that our readers are telling us, especially during the pandemic right now. Um, suddenly, there's been a strong interest in remote condition monitoring for obvious reasons, like if you can't have somebody on site, uh, how do you set up a system? So given that we saw a strong interest emerge in the past 18 months, what do you see driving remote condition monitoring in 2022? How do you see it evolving in the coming year? I think we'll see that um, because of the, the inability of people to be on site, I, th- I think there's sort of a secular trend, which is um, the graying of the workforce and a lot of people heading towards retirement. Uh, and that was accelerated quite a bit with COVID in terms of people really um, rethinking. So, I mean, just in general, their life choices and how much if they want to continue working or if they want to ease into retirement, uh, as well as with health concerns, people not being uh, comfortable going on premise and going into, the, into facilities and performing maintenance activities. So I think what we've seen in a sort of an acceleration in an interest at looking at um, into alternatives uh, rather than rec- using pe- their own staff to do maintenance inspections on premise. And mm-hmm. as we've sort of been through the peaks and troughs of COVID, particularly when we were going when we were going through the, the large area of uncertainty, uh, there was a lot of interest in the um, RCM and in, in the remote condition monitoring services, uh, but, not, but not necessarily an ability to actually take advantage of them because of the, the um, travel issues and access issues. So now okay. the vaccination rates coming up and people getting more comfortable um, with reopening their facilities, I think is when we're going to see in 2022 a significant adoption of those services. The 20, end of 2021 was really um, kind of learning what it's all about and how, what, are the, what are alternatives for how we can pr- perform these maintenance activities in this monitoring. In 2022, we'll see now people taking advantage of that, as I said, and really starting to, starting to see a sharp uptake in the services. Interesting. You know, one of plant services missions is to help provide uh, our readers and industry in general with as much information about these sort of new topics. And it, it, it sounds like that education effort industry-wide is well underway. Like people have been looking at it for a while. And so you you think that like the average plant is probably poised in 22 to take, take a stronger action? It's a great question. I think that there's um, a, a broader understanding um, of the availability of these services uh, mm-hmm. in, in both the um, RCM aspects, as well as a bit more of the transitioning to continuous monitoring versus route-based. Mm. I think there's certainly room for more, more education and more awareness to be raised about the breadth of the assets that can be covered, covered um, as well as the affordability of the services themselves. Okay. Yeah, that's that, that's an issue too. I mean, it, it, it went, you know, costs can be variable for these kind of situations, but that's 
a lot of times when we survey our readers, Aaron, what we find out is they're not really sure how to quantify the benefits of solutions like this. And so uh, costs can be an obstacle, especially if they're not sure what will the return be? How are we going to get back? Yeah. So I think what we have is um, we have an understanding that, of course, that uh, planned downtime is better than unplanned downtime and that uh, the ability to perform pre preventative maintenance that will particularly lower uh, less um, maintenance activity, less en en um, engineering resource effort, as well as uh, potentially with lower cost parts uh, will, will is inherently um, better for the better for a business than having uh, an unplanned outage and having to perform major major repairs to, to a system, uh, particularly because of the inability to. Um, there's a kind of a, a concurrent trend, which is um, supply chain limitations. Mm. And one of, one of the areas that we're seeing is, is that, um, you know, if you have, if we're able to provide you through RCM or, the, or a customer, a, a plant supervisor is able through RCM to have an earlier lead time of a fault, then they're, they're much more likely to be able to, do, to order the parts that they need and have them in-house and be ready to be able to schedule the repair uh, before that, that, that identify that predictive fault actually occurs and takes down the plant and they have a, a, a significant line down while they're trying to deal with supply chain, chain issues and get repair parts in. Yeah, and for our listeners, we're recording this podcast right before Christmas. And Aaron, the supply chain topic makes me think that, you know, the, the toy shortage we were all warned about, uh, we haven't felt it here in Chicago so much. We were okay. Um, but where I see it all the time, actually, is baseball cards. It, it's such a minor thing. Um, oh, really? Yeah, my top, the Tops company releases their, their year set in two different waves. And we found a lot of the first wave before the summertime. But now for the second year in a row, we haven't seen the second wave. And we're not sure what, what the supply chain issue is, whether it's a delivery issue, whether it's a cardboard shortage, or whether it's a choice by Tops to say, okay, sales weren't great in the first half. So now let's dial back in the second half. So it's just interesting how one little thing like that can sort of stand in for uh, for for such a large issue. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, within uh, Fluke broadly, um, we see uh, we've had significant supply chain challenges. It's been an ongoing activity, as uh, you and I discussed um, even earlier this week. We were supposed to meet to record this podcast, and I unfortunately had to bail bail out so I could go deal with some of our own supply chain challenges internally. Sure, it's definitely been an interesting uh, twelve months or so, and it looks like it's going to stay this way. I mean, you know, we're forecasting continued supply chain challenges through the end of 22. Yeah, that, that's an issue that's even more foreground in, in our readers' minds than even uh, real condition monitoring. Um, since you mentioned EMAIM before, can you talk a little bit about how an EAM system can help bring reliability back to the supply chain, the impact that can make when, when it's all being done right? Yeah, I, mean, I think the main thing is, <clears throat> you know, the, the, in EAM, in, in terms of the, the key thing on the reliability side is that in order to be to have an effective maintenance program, um, you need to understand what preventive maintenance procedures need to be run. You need to know when you're going to run them. Uh, ideally, you know, where there's a lot of work being done, particularly on the RCM side, to transition from uh, meter-based or time-based maintenance into condition-based maintenance. Uh, but still, you know, if you have all that um, the condition monitoring up front, or, or you have your your meters coming into a system uh, triggering the, the maintenance program. If you're not actually effectively perform or tracking and performing that maintenance, then having knowing that you need to do it is only half of the solution. And, and, it's, and a, a tool, a set of software like eMaint is really to help you perform that the opt track and track and execute well the PMs the PMs that need to be done. Uh, is we also see the application of AI and ML in that space as well. Um, again, an advantage of a SaaS platform such as eMaint is is with the, the large data sets we have of PMs being done for a wide variety of assets. We're able to start looking at um, comparing best practices across uh, multiple customers, but as well as looking for a given asset class, which PM routines are, are you know, constructive. You're actually seeing an improvement in the reliability of the asset uh, in which you know, PM routines actually are potentially destructive, um, either because, you know, I don't know about you, but, but when I perform maintenance, maintenance, kind of maintenance routine at home, I feel like there's always that one screw left over that I forgot where it goes back to. I know, where'd it come from, right? Always, there's something left over. <laughs> And so one of the things that we're, we're looking at is exactly on the PM side is, is, is a similar thing. I mean, the, the, the OEM will tell you here the routines you should perform, but there's, it's, it's quite possible that either they're not necessary because they're not really contributing to the health of the asset mm -hmm. or potentially that, as I said, that, I mean, the fact that you're, you're cracking the system open and performing some maintenance on it is actually ultimately leading to a long-term degradation of its reliability. Oh. So we see that the, the structure of the PMs in e-main and then the, the application of AI and ML as being you know, the, the, the basics of the PM being a firm foundation for reliability, 
uh -huh. uh, and it being a starting point to actually do PM optimization over the long term as well. That's really fascinating. Um, you know, a lot of the AI and ML use cases that we've encountered at least have been to predict the imminent failure, to identify the anomaly. Um, what you're talking about is an intriguing new case. This is, this is the first time I'm hearing about it, where you can identify um, the harmful work, not just you, not just work that's no longer useful, but work that may actually be introducing the false faults. Uh, exactly. Yeah, I think if you think about the, we, we think um, about asset performance management broadly. You know, this kind of um, the evolution of reliability again away from sort of the time-based and scheduled scheduled PMs into condition and prescriptive um, maintenance driven by AI and analytics. Mm -hmm. What we we see is, is that there's kind of a, the, the kernel of it, the nugget of it is really what we might consider asset health. And that is this condition-based um, predictive, just kind of the, using condition monitoring to do predictions of the asset health. Um, but the evolution of that will, is, is, as I said, ultimately uh, PM optimization and deciding okay. what, which maintenance routines really are the ones which Preventive maintenance makes sense to be done um, because it's improving the health versus, as I said, which could be left set aside. There's also some room there as well as you look at um, if you have a large as if you have a large enough fleet of assets to start doing some comparisons, both in terms of not just is this PM routine effective or not, but with the de with detailed work instructions and the capturing of the PM in a work order in a tool like eMate, mm -hmm. you can start doing analysis to determine if two different uh, entities or two different work you know, um, maintenance crews. Are performing the same PM, looking at the variation between those PM, the, those the actual execution of the PMs, and seeing what um, in, to the PM routines, and seeing actually which one of them is more effective in improving the asset health as well. That's fascinating, and I, I can see why AI and ML sort of made your 2022 trends list because we're we're talking not just about the the conventional applications, but also about these new applications like you like, like you're talking. Um, it occurs to me too that when it comes to PM optimization, one of the challenges always is getting the workforce on board with it because, you know, you got the anecdotal case of say you've got some, uh, a, a, a time-based maintenance round that's in the system. Um, it may not be useful anymore, but the people who are walking the round may know it, but they may want a little 10 minute break. So they mm -hmm. go, go ahead and do the round anyway. Um, it, it could be a case where you've got someone new and you, you, you put them on lubrication duty and all they do is they go and squirt some grease into the bearing. Um, if it leaks, who cares? If it doesn't leak, who cares? They just know they did it on time. Um, do you see AA and ML giving teams a chance to sort of tighten up their approach to maintenance and, and, and avoid these kind of issues where the workforce mindset might change towards more of a reliability mindset? That's a great question. I, I think um, there's certainly opportunity in the sense that um, by having that the, the larger data sets and being able to look for variation in the performance of an asset after a maintenance routine uh, to then look for kind of trying, trying to identify common root causes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know that the, so I, but I think in terms of, if you think about the workforce, um, certainly the, the, the tool set will enable a workforce uh, to be more effective, mm -hmm. uh, but there's fundamentally a significant change management um, activity that needs to be undertaken and process needs to be undertaken by the, by the maintenance, the leadership of that maintenance team. Um, mm -hmm. Because of the, because of the things you're saying, you're sort of you're, you're alluding to, in that if this is the way we've always done it, and we think this is what works, and you're you're bringing in a tool, and the tool is telling us to do something different. Um, they need people need to be educated as to um, maybe not all the underlying math, but but you know, kind of being, being given a bit of background as to you know, what have we looked at, who are we who are we benchmarking you against, and why do we think that what the tool is, is telling you to do, and mm -hmm. what recommendations are actually correct, even if they may fly in the face of your anecdotal experience. So I think we see that this, the adoption of, of more sophisticated uh, planning and analytics tools uh, powered by AI and ML will require you know, change management champions within reliability organizations to, to see widespread adoption. Okay. Do you see AI and ML um, helping teams embrace a more proactive mindset, especially if they want to? Um, or do you see AI and ML having uh, uh, an effect where it's really going to spread across proactive, some reactive, and some time-based. Where eventually we're going to see applications for this, 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 this leading technology to to be applied, not just in the cutting edge stuff, but on on, on everything people are doing anyway right now. I, I think certainly um, in in the, the near term, um, what we see is is that the use of AI and ML democratizing expertise. 
Mm-hmm. And so it's taking um, a maintenance organization that is already interested in improving, kind of, I think, already interested in improving the reliability mm-hmm. um, and making them able to scale their existing expertise and their scaling resources, scaling mm-hmm. their existing resources uh, to really take on balance of plant. So, you know, every, every facility has their handful of critical assets and then they have the balance of plant, plant assets as well. And if mm-hmm. you've already got a proactive mindset towards reliability, probably focused on your most critical assets, we see that the, the use of, again, advanced software solutions or potentially, you know, or, um, the adoption of RCM by a third party allowing you to t- apply that proactive mindset to, to the balance of plant. Uh, and then I think over time, you know, you'll see there's always in every industry that I've served, I mean, that I've worked, I built solutions for, there's always your, your leading lights, your, your lighthouse adopters of technology who kind of set the gold standard that, that other people come behind or mm-hmm. follow, follow behind. And I think that's what we'll see here. We'll see the people who have already have a proactive mindset um, aggressively adopting the AI and ML based solutions or RCM solutions to get the balance of plant. And then kind of the, 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 the kind of the, the laggards is maybe not the right word, but the, the kind of the, the people who are wait, taking the wait and see attitude when they see that it's successful, then they'll come behind it as well. Okay. Well, let me ask you one more trans question. This one's on cybersecurity. Um, a year ago, we did our cover story uh, on drone attacks and physical security because mm-hmm. there had just been a drone attack in Saudi Aramco. Um, a, a couple months previous in 2019, 2019, I believe it was. Um, suddenly, after that, solar winds happened, and there hasn't been any more dram- as dramatic physical attacks, but you know, cyber attacks are making daily headlines. Uh, let me ask you this Is cybersecurity now, do you think, sort of so baked in to what people are doing with remote condition monitoring, with machine learning and AI, uh, with, with EAM systems? that as these conversations develop with implants, uh, with service providers, is it now baked in enough that people have a reasonable expectation that what, what's in the market is going to be as secure as it can be? Because I'm, I'm hearing less open talk about it. So I'm, I'm wondering, is, is it now sort of almost being, uh, it, it has it now been normalized as part of the conversation? I think, you know, it, it is um, it is a uh, table stakes expectation um, and rightly so uh, mm-hmm. of customers of solutions like ours and of, of any kind of um, SaaS or remote, remote management solution mm-hmm. uh, that you have a very high bar for cybersecurity. Um, but I think it is still, a, it is still a differentiator in the market and still something that as a procurer of these services, you, you, sh- you should be um, poking on and pushing on your vendor to ensure that they, they are meeting your expectations. Mm-hmm. There's um, it's uh you know, it, 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 it's, it, it's a risk. Cybersecurity is inherently a risk and it can never be 100% mitigated, but there's right. some basic groundwork that should exist in any, in any, third, in any vendor. Um, mm-hmm. And then there's, then there's a lot of room to continue to provide best, best of breed um, kind of capabilities in cybersecurity to protect your assets, to protect your customers, your end customers' assets. So I think it's not, um, I don't know if it's not being talked about because it's taken for granted, um, but, but certainly it shouldn't be taken for granted. It should be something that, that as, as a customer, you are um, pushing on your suppliers uh, to ensure that they have high standards. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's just funny that for a while there, it seemed like it was a hot topic and, uh, and it hasn't gone away exactly, but I appreciate your perspective on that. We, we've been hearing too, that people are embracing the idea of that without a response plan. Also, you're not really cyber secure because that response plan helps drive things like effective backup systems and, and, and similar. So it's interesting that she mentioned that there was a uh, vulnerability released um, or uh, announced um, last Friday in a in a software utility called Log4j. Oh yeah. Which, which and so coincidentally, I mean, which, so for us, we immediately triggered our incident response program, um, and we had we had um, our head of cybersecurity, our head of um, production operations, and a large part portion of my engineering team uh-huh. um, working around the clock, starting as, as soon as that announcement came out uh, to rem- remediate the issue. Mm-hmm. Um, and in our case, we, we immediately mitigated the, did, did, took the required steps to mitigate the risk, and we're still in the process now of doing the um, interesting kind of the, the after action reporting in retrospectives to see how we could have handled it better. Wow! And that's uh, on a consumer level. The way it impacted my life was that my kids want to play Minecraft Java Edition, which mm-hmm. is only available over PCs. Um, the version they've got in their Xbox right now apparently is unaffected by this flaw. But if you had the edition for Java, 
that was where the air was gripping in. And thankfully, it's something they want from Santa, so they don't have it yet. And I'm glad about that. <laughs> and so, they're going to be, uh, be immediately downloading an update for it as soon as they as soon as they unwrap it. Oh gosh, they're they're and they love updates. I just got they they just like were yelling like crazy. Why is Fortnite taking 45 minutes to update? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think so. I, but you'll see that again. Like, in, it's it's been, this is why it's um, it's something that is that is table stakes, and but huh. um, as a customer, you should you should be able to take for granted. Um, but as a but practically speaking, um, it, it's an evolving landscape, and it's always important that you do check with your vendors, and you're com- you're comfortable that they have the right practices in place, and it should be one of your decision criteria before before purchasing a particular solution. Excellent. Well, you know, Aaron, thank you for mapping out these these three tr- key trends for 2022 with us today. Uh, where can people go for more information on these topics if, if they want to learn more? Uh, I would say to go to www.fluke.com. Okay. And uh, the Fluke's got a lot of articles also placed with plantservices.com. So uh, for anyone who's looking for more information, go to one of those two places, of course. And if you like, you can seek any, either one of us out on LinkedIn. So uh, Aaron, thank you so much for being with us today. Tom, thank you so much. I'm a long-time listener on the podcast. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today.